recording recording has started as i said i will start with the review of chapter one first we were halfway through in chapter one in this course we are going to cover the thermal fluids sciences and when we say thermal fluid sciences they are thermodynamics fluid mechanics and heat transfer and the general name of them can also be called thermal systems engineering because thermal fluid sciences cover many applications in both mechanical engineering and other engineering disciplines. So let's start with the meaning of thermal systems engineering. Thermal systems engineering deals with the storage transfer and conversion of energy. Energy can be stored in any way, such as chemical or kinetic or electrical or potential, and it can be transferred between the systems as work or heat, or in the case of open systems, as the flow of hot or cold streams. So we will uh, separate the systems into two. We will classify them as two systems. One of them is closed system, and the other one is open system. In the case of closed system, the energy can be transferred as work or heat. And in the case of open systems, energy can be transferred as work, heat, as well as flow of the hot or cold streams of the matter. And energy can be converted from any, any type to another type. For instance, chemical energy can be converted to heat, or heat energy can be converted to work, and so forth. So in this course, we will be dealing with storage, transfer, and conversion of energy. Here, we are given some examples of conversion of energy. For instance, the first figure is a jet engine. In the jet engine, inside the combustion chamber or combustor, jet fuel is burned or combusted to obtain high temperature, or in other words, in thermodynamics language, high enthalpy gases. And these high enthalpy gases the energy of the high enthalpy gases are converted to kinetic energy as they leave the nozzle in the back of the engine. And because they have high kinetic energy, or in other words, high velocity, there will be a, a change in the momentum. This momentum change will cause this engine to move to the left. We will see in the fluid mechanics that momentum must be conserved so because of the <clears throat> conservation of momentum principle as the gases leave the back of the engine they, they will apply a force to the left a thrust force this is the uh, this is called the change of momentum or conservation of momentum principle same thing happens in in here in, in a jet ski also, water comes in uh, inside the jet ski. There is a pump here. The pump accelerates the water to the back of the jet ski. As the water is accelerated, its velocity is increased, very similar to the jet engine. And due to the increase in velocity, there will be a change of momentum. And this momentum change would cause this jet ski to move to the left. We will see all these principles, so don't worry about the principle too much, but what I mean here is energy is converted from one, one type to another type. At the bottom of the page, you see a power plant, an electrical power plant, in which energy is converted from some form to another. In this power plant, we have a boiler or, or steam generator 
in which water is converted to vapor, liquid water is converted to vapor, and this is done by burning coal. So when the coal is burned, its chemical energy is converted to heat, and this heat converts the liquid water to vapor, and this vapor goes to a turbine and rotates this turbine, and because of the rotation of the turbine, a generator, which is connected to this turbine, also rotated and it produces electricity. And this electricity is transferred into the electric lines, electric network. So as you can see, we have started with chemical energy, then heat energy, then mechanical energy, then electrical energy. You can see that energy can uh, have been uh, converted from one to another many times. Of course, there are some auxiliaries of the system. There has to be a connection uh, to get rid of the waste gases, which is a stack. And we will mention it later. It's not possible to convert all the heat to work because of the uh, second law of thermodynamics, there are laws of thermodynamics, because of the second law of thermodynamics, it's not possible to convert all the heat to work. Instead, some of the heat must be rejected. Otherwise, a cycle cannot be completed. So here, the vapor, the steam that leaves the turbine, has to be converted into liquid so that it can be pumped back into the boiler again. As you can see, there is a cycle of steam and liquid water here. This is a cycle. So here, the vapor that leaves the turbine is converted to liquid. Otherwise, it's not possible to pump it back into the generator or into the steam generator or other words into the boiler. So as you can see, some energy obtained from the burning of the coal must be rejected. And this is required by the second law of thermodynamics. Also here, this is the space station that orbits the Earth. The energy requirement for the space station is obtained from the uh, photovoltaic panels, and they are the solar cell arrays or photovoltaic panels. And the solar energy, the photonic energy, is converted to electricity on the panels, and this electricity is used inside the uh, space station as directly as electricity or some other way. Maybe it can be converted to heat or some other energy type. But as you can see here, also energy is converted from one form to another. This is an example of manufacturing of semiconductors. Heat transfer effects are used in the uh, process of the uh, manufacturing of semiconductors. Human body is another example of conversion of energy because first air comes through the windpipe or thorax and inside the lungs there is a reaction between the blood and air oxygen inside the air is transferred into the blood meanwhile the blood that returns from the body transfers its carbon dioxide to blood again or air again and uh, all these things are examples of conversions of chemical to heat or heat to uh, chemical energy. Also, as you can see, fluid flow and heat transfer is also 
uh, involved in here. Some other examples of thermal systems, for instance, there's a hot water preparation system here, hot water heater, it can use chemicals such as natural gas or liquid fuel or electricity to obtain hot water. Once the water is heated, it goes to the faucet. And in the faucet, it's combined with cold water to have warm water. So as you can see, here we have the conversion of energy from chemical or electricity to heat energy. Inside the pipes, we have fluid flow. Here we have some example of thermodynamics because hot and cold water is mixed to have warm water. Besides, we may say that this hot uh, water heater may lose some of the heat because it's not perfectly insulated. So you can see that in one picture, we have an example of heat transfer, fluid mechanics, as well as thermodynamics. Another example can be a hybrid car. In the hybrid car, you may know, we have both uh, internal combustion engine and electrical motors. So normal operation may use internal combustion engine or electric motors, while some of the energy can be converted to electrical energy and stored inside the batteries. By doing this, it's possible to increase the performance of the car and uh, according to the recent developments, it's possible to obtain uh, very low fuel consumptions of almost 3.5 liters per 100 kilometers. And it's done by some additions to this hybrid car. For instance, uh, recovering energy by installing regenerative uh, braking systems. So while braking, instead of converting the energy, braking energy into heat, it's possible to convert this braking energy into electrical energy. And this electrical energy can be, can be stored in the batteries. So this could be one advantage of the hybrid car. Another way to save energy or increase the efficiency of this car can be shutting off the gasoline when the car stops at a stop line, uh, at the at a, uh, stop line, uh, stop lights. So during the traffic, you may need to stop many times. So it's not necessary to keep the engine running. It's actually called on-off systems. So in the cars with on-off systems, the engine is stopped when the car comes to a stop sign. And this would be another save of, uh, way of saving energy. The aerodynamics of car is very important also because making the car streamlined, meaning that aerodynamically uh, streamlined, is possible to reduce the drag force, the friction force with the car and the air. And by reducing the friction force between the car and the air, it's also possible to save a lot of energy. Also, the tire type is may, may be important because depending on the car type, uh, tire type, if you choose low rolling resistant friction tires, it can save you some energy as well. Another way could be the use of lightweight composite materials. In the past, the cars were always heavier than two tons, but nowadays you can find 
a sedan car less than 1,000 kilograms. Especially during the acceleration, mass is very important. Also, of course, on the way, mass is important as far as the rolling friction is concerned. Uh, concerned. So, reducing the mass of the car would reduce the consumption of the fuel. And uh, by this way, the car can be made energy efficient. Manufacturing of printed circuit boards or PCBs can require a lot of uh, interaction with heat and fluid flow. So never mind the details of the process, but what it says is using the principles of heat transfer, PCBs, the principles printed circuit boards can be processed automatically by using such a machine. So at the end of the process, all the members, such as the integrated circuits or other electrical or electronic elements will be soldered on the PCB automatically as it travels through the tunnel. So it comes into the tunnel without the solders done. So at the exit of the tunnel, solders have been finalized automatically. And this is done by the principles of heat transfer. When we analyze thermal systems, we use three conservation equations. And the three conservation equations can also be seen in heat transfer, thermodynamics, as well as fluid mechanics. They are the conservation of mass, conservation of energy, and conservation of momentum. Conservation means they're not destroyed, they're not created. They can be converted from one form to another. So this is what it, what it means by conservation. But we need to have another principle, another law, which is second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics states that energy has a certain direction, not just any direction. According to this principle, energy is transferred from, for instance, high temperature to low temperature, or high voltage to low voltage, or high pressure to low pressure, or high concentration to low concentration. So the direction is very definite. It's not just any direction, but it's a certain direction. And this is indicated in the uh, statement of second law of thermodynamics. There are other indications of second law of thermodynamics, but let's start with this first. Then we will learn the details of the second law of thermodynamics later. Thermodynamics uses conservation of mass, conservation of energy, second law of thermodynamics, and properties. What we mean by properties are uh, measurements such as density, volume, temperature, pressure, and so forth. So a substance will change its properties depending on, for instance, changes in pressure and temperatures. So it's important to check the properties to understand the thermodynamics of the process. Heat transfer uses the three modes of heat transfer modes, conduction, convection, and radiation. And it's also possible to have these modes to at the same time, on all three at the same time, which is called multiple mode. And in fluid mechanics, we use fluid statics in which the fluid does not move, is stationary. And in this case, we, we call it fluid statics. For instance, in the measurement of the pressure of a water column, we use the principle of 
on theory of fluid statics. Conservation of momentum, mechanical energy equation, are used in fluid dynamics. So in fluid dynamics, we mean a fluid that moves, so a fluid in motion. Then we have two types of fluid mechanics. Mechanics is also two types, statics and dynamics. First fluid statics, then fluid dynamics. Also in the fluid mechanics, we cover similitude and modeling because when we start the design of a fluid mechanics system, it's not possible to produce a full type prototype. For instance, you cannot produce a full type aircraft before you test it because an aircraft can be 100 meters long, can be several thousand tons several tons so uh, sorry several hundred tons so because it's not possible to have a full size model of the aircraft you prepare a smaller model of it and test it in a let's say wind tunnel but there are rules to it you cannot just have any smaller model you have to have the rules of similar to the modeling and by testing it in a, uh, in a wind tunnel, you can get some results such as drag coefficient, and you can use this same drag coefficient, which will be valid for the prototype, full size prototype also. When it comes to design of thermal systems, these uh, three principles disciplines are used and they are used inside the design operations or maintenance marketing and sales costing and many other uh, fields in the design of a thermal systems engineering systems thermodynamics uh, is actually a science or a discipline of energy, it mainly deals with energy. It uses the principles of conservation of mass energy. Also, it uses the second law of thermodynamics that I just explained to you. Fluid mechanics could be fluid statics, which deals with fluids stationary, not moving, of fluid dynamics that deals with fluids, uh, with, uh, fluids with motion. For fluids with motion or fluid uh, dynamics, conservation of momentum and mechanical energy equation are used. And as I said, in the design of uh, fluid mechanics systems, concepts of similar to the modeling are used as well. Heat transfer deals with the modes of energy transfer by heat. Energy transfer by heat is because of the temperature differences between two media. So if there is a temperature difference between two media, an energy flow will take place from high temperature medium to low temperature medium. But this transfer of heat can be in three different forms. It can be in conduction, it can be in convection, or it can be in thermal radiation. In the case of conduction, the molecules or atoms vibrate or move around, and this motion of the uh, molecules or atoms, vibration of uh, moving, will convey the energy to the adjacent particles and this type of energy this mode of energy transfer is called conduction in the case of convection there has to be a solid surface as well as a liquid where we say not liquid a fluid where we say a fluid it uh, involves both liquids and gases so 
In the case of a solid uh, surface and a fluid having having contact with each other, and if they have different temperatures, there will be a heat transfer between the solid and the fluid. And this type of heat transfer will, is, co is uh, called convection. And in the convection, we have to understand that there is always be a fluid motion, which will uh, cause the fluid uh, heat transfer to be called convection. So in the case of a conduction, there is no fluid involved, or if any fluid exists in the medium, it does not move. But in the case of convection, the fluid must move so that the heat transfer can be called convection. Thermal radiation is something completely different. So according to the uh, quantum theory, all the matters uh, produce photonic energy depending on their surface temperatures. So due to the surface temperature changes, all the surfaces transmit energy depending on their temperatures. For instance, if a substance has a absolute zero temperature, which is minus 273 degrees or zero Kelvin. In this case, its energy is zero. So in the case of absolute zero temperature, the matter, the material, the surface, whatever it is, has zero energy. But other than uh, zero temperatures, all the materials, all the substance have a level of energy radiant energy and surfaces always exchange radiant energy among themselves and this is called thermal radiation it's also possible to have conduction and convection together or convection and conduction uh, thermal radiation together or all three together and this type of situation is called multi-mode heat transfer Before starting thermodynamics, we have to understand some concepts and some definitions. First, let's take a look at the uh, verb, uh, word of thermodynamics. The word thermodynamics comes from Greek, therme, heat, and dynamis, force. So it's like heat force. It starts like this, but of course, uh, it's not a force anymore in today's science, but uh, the original name has been preserved, so the thermodynamics comes from the Greek words heat plus force. System is a very important concept in thermodynamics. A system is the subject of the analysis. So if you're analyzing a system thermodynamically, uh, something thermodynamically, which can be as small as one millimeter or as large as a factory. And this uh, subject of analysis is called a system. A system does not have to have a constant boundary or it doesn't have to be stationary. So if you're dealing with the thermodynamics of an aircraft, it's moving. So the system is not stationary. Or if the system is a balloon that's uh, increasing its volume by uh, expanding, the boundary is not constant, but still we can call it a system. Outside the system is called surroundings. So whatever is outside the system is called the surrounding. Uh, the system is uh, separated from the surroundings by its boundary. So the uh, boundary is what is 
found at the uh, system surroundings and system itself. Closed system and open system, I will explain it later. If a system is a closed system, it means that there is no uh, mass crossing the system. So a closed cylinder, a completely closed cylinder, or a container which is completely closed are closed systems because the mass, the air mass, for instance, or liquid mass or the fluid mass inside them are, co are constant. They do not change. There is no mass interaction through the boundary. So if any mass, uh, if no mass is crossing the boundary of a system, this system is called a closed system. If this closed system is, on the other hand, also insulated against any heat interaction, so suppose that you have insulated this closed system so well that it's not losing any heat, it's not gaining any heat, there is no heat interaction or there is no work interaction, then it says, it says that this system is an isolated system. So if there is no uh, mass crossing the boundary and no energy crosses the mass boundary, it's called an isolated system. So isolated system is already a closed system, but it's a closed system with no energy interaction as well. On the other hand, open systems are those systems with a mass crossing their boundaries. So there are many examples of open systems we can see around. For instance, consider this system. This is the system boundary, the dashed lines. In the system, we have an air tank, a compressor, and uh, as you can see, air is crossing the boundary. So mass is entering the system. So that this is an open system. Also, because the motor, the electric motor, uses electrical energy. So as you can see, electricity, the energy crosses the boundary as well. Another example of an open system can be an engine, internal combustion engine. So internal combustion engine is chosen to be the open system. The dashed lines are the system boundary. And as you can see, there is Mass flows in and out of the system. For instance, air comes through the system boundary for the engine to use it as combustion. Fuel uh, crosses the boundary. Again, it's necessary for combustion. As a result of combustion, exhaust gases are produced. Exhaust gases crosses the boundary. So there are masses coming in and mass is going up, as well as energy crosses the boundary because when this engine is operated, it produces power. And this power crosses the boundary of the system, for instance, by means of a rotating shaft. This shaft can drive a generator or it can drive the propeller of a, of a, main, uh, of a boat or it can drive the uh, tires of a car. So as you can see, both the energy and the mass crosses the boundary of this open system. An example of a closed system, this is an internal engine cross section. There are uh, valves, inlet valve, exhaust valve, and there is a spark plug. This uh, uh, gasoline engine, by the way. So as the piston goes down, how can we know that it's going down? Due to the rotation of this crank. So when the crank rotates like this, this piston goes down. And uh, at this moment, at this very moment, when two valves are closed, 
the piston just moves down. The boundary is moving. It's not stationary boundary. But because the two valves are closed, at this instant, it's an open system. So it's an open system with a moving boundary. There is no mass coming in or coming out. That's why we call it an open, a closed system. But of course, it's producing energy. So energy is crossing the boundary, as well as there is some heat interaction between the hot gas here and uh, the boundary. So in a closed system, it's only energy that can cross the boundary, not mass. In an isolated system, neither energy nor mass can cross the boundary. In an open system, both energy and mass can cross the boundary. So what is property? We said property is one of the important concepts in thermodynamics. Property uh, is a character characteristic of a system such as mass, volume, energy, pressure, and temperature to which a numerical value can be assigned. So by checking the property of a system or set, set of the properties of the system, we can have an idea, opinion regarding the state of the proper a state of the thermodynamic system i will mention what the state is but in order to give the state of a system it's necessary to know the properties of the uh, system a property can be extensive or it can be intensive let me first start with the intensive you can remember intensive from independent it uh, sounds like independent, intensive. Independent pro properties are those independent of intensive properties are those independent of the size of the system. For instance, specific volume, pressure, or temperature. Because if you divide the system by two, by three, by infinitely many times, pressure or temperature or specific volume do not change. So they are called intensive properties because they are independent of the size. On the other hand, extensive properties are dependent on the size. They are mass, volume, energy, and some other properties. For instance, if you divide the system into two, mass is also divided into two, or energy con uh, content is, so, is also divided into two. State refers to the condition of a system as described by its properties. So to define the state, you need to provide some properties. So depending on the phase of a system, for instance, uh, many times you may need to provide at least two independent properties or two intensive properties to define the state of a system. For instance, remember, according to the ideal gases, you need to know at least two of the properties, such as pressure and temperature, to calculate the third property, such as density. But sometimes you may need only one property. For instance, during the uh, phase change, it's necessary to know only one of the properties. For instance, the phase change of water requires that you only know either pressure, the saturation pressure, or satura saturation temperature. Otherwise, you have to have at least two independent properties, two intensive properties, to fix the state of our system. Process is the transformation from one state to another state. If a system uh, goes through one state to another state, you, un you have to understand that some properties have changed. If the properties remain the same, then the state is the same. We may have steady state versus transient or time-dependent. 
in the case of steady state, properties do not change with time. So if there is no change with time, we call it steady state. Otherwise, we call it time dependent or transient. Thermodynamic cycle, after a sequence of states, processes, if the processes start uh, come to the starting point, then we call it a cycle. Remember the power generation plant, So in, in this power generation plant, we have a situation which starts with liquid water. This liquid water goes into the boiler. It becomes a steam. Then after passing through the turbine, it's converted to liquid water again. So it starts with water, liquid water, and it ends up with that liquid water again. It means that this is a cycle. So in a cycle, starting and ending points are the same. Phase uh, deals with the physical appearance of a material or a, not, or a substance. A substance can be in solid phase, in liquid phase, or gas phase. It's also possible to have two phases together, which we call multi-phase. A superior substance is a substance that is uniform uh, in chemical com composition, regardless of the phase itself, phase of it. So, for instance, Water is a pure substance because whether in solid or liquid or gas, the chemical uh, cos composition is the same. You always have H2O. But on the other hand, consider air. Air can be considered to be a pure substance during the atmospheric conditions. You have 79% nitrogen plus 21% oxygen, but under very high pressures, either nitrogen or oxygen will condensate first, will be liquefied first. So inside the uh, inside the gas, you have less nitrogen or less oxygen, meaning that it's not a pure substance because depending on the phase the chemical composition is not the same. Most of the times, a process will not take in equilibrium, but for the sake of thermodynamic calculations, we assume that, uh, we assume that the process is in equilibrium. This type of assumption is called quasi-equilibrium. Units and dimensions. Units and dimensions are very important in all engineering disciplines. You have to separate, uh, the, you have to uh, differentiate between the units and dimensions and uh, knowledgeable about the unit conversions. Not all of them, but the main conversions uh, should be done by heart. Many of them can be provided to you, but main conversions such as mass conversions, uh, volume conversions must be done by heart by you. A unit is a specified amount of quantity by comparison with which any quantity of the same kind is measured. For instance, meters, centimeters, kilometers, and uh, these are the units in uh, international system of measurement or feet inches and miles these are the units of uh, measurement uh, length measurement in ip system and they are all units of length 
primary dimensions, uh, when we say dimension, uh, they are uh, the characteristic to which a unit is given. For instance, these characteristics are mass, length, time, and temperature. These are the uh, four main characteristics that we are going to use in the in this course. M, the capital M, uh, represents the mass. The capital L represents the length. Small case T represents the uh, time, and capital T represents the temperature. We will be mostly dealing with SI systems, but sometimes you may run across some examples of IP systems. For instance, inches, feet, gallons. You may be using them without uh, knowing that you are using them. For instance, when you put air in, in the tire of a car, it's actually in PSI. You put air of 30, it's actually 30 pounds per square inch of air. It's a pressure dimension or pressure unit. And it's almost two atmospheres. Or uh, you buy water by, uh, by a container, which is 19 liters. And it's actually a five gallon container. So without the knowing uh, of the of the of the unit, you somehow use it. But in this course, we are going to use the SI unit systems, and SI unit systems are kilograms, meters, seconds, and for temperature, Kelvin. So we will be always dealing with SI systems of units. These are. Uh, primary units or primary dimensions. There are also secondary dimensions. Secondary dimensions are derived from the primary dimensions. For instance, force is a secondary dimension, secondary unit. It's derived from uh, meters, kilograms, and second, because it has the unit of Newton, and Newton is kilograms times meters per second square. According to Newton's second law, uh, force is equal to mass times acceleration. And the uh, unit here is Newton. You can describe it uh, as the force necessary to accelerate of, of one kilogram mass by one meter per second square. So in order to uh, increase the speed of the mass of one kilogram, it's necessary to, uh, by one meters per second square, it's necessary to apply one Newton on it. Okay. Uh, we should have some break, I guess. If you don't have any questions, we're going to have a 10 minute break. Do we have any questions? Okay, so we will have a 10 minute break. We will be back in here at two o'clock. Recording has started. So let's take a look at some of the properties. Uh, most important properties are specific volume, 
pressure and temperature. Sometimes we use density instead of specific volume because density is the inverse of specific volume. Remember from physics that density is mass per unit volume and specific density is volume per, uh, per mass. So they are inverse of each other. The calculation of density is mass divided by volume. And if there is a non-uniformity within the medium, then mass of the material, mass of the substance can be calculated by the integral of rho times dv. This is when the rho density is a function of volume. So in the case of varying, volume, uh, varying densities, the mass can be calculated as the integral of rho dv. If, of course, rho is constant, it goes out of integral, and the integral of dv is just v, so mass is going to be rho times v. Chemical people uses a mole amount instead of density most of the time. So the mole amount is mass divided by the molar mass of a material. For instance, if you have the mass of water divided by molar mass, and the molar mass of water, as you know, is 18, so you can find how many moles are included in this mass of the water. But in engineering, in mechanical engineering, and in other uh, disciplines of engineering, uh, density is used instead of molar amount. But sometimes we may need to use molar amount also. Another intensive property is the pressure. Pressure, remember from physics, is the force per unit area. So force divided by area is the pressure. Some units of pressure is Pascal, which is one Newton per square meter. So if you have one Newton applied on a area, which is one square meter, it's called one Pascal. One kilopascal is 1,000 Pascal or 1,000 Newtons per square meter. One bar is 100,000 or 10 to the 5 Newtons per square meter. And one megapascal is medium Newtons per square meter. So sometimes we may need to use kilos, megas, in order not to use many zero. Kilo means thousand, mega means uh, medium. By the way, the atmospheric pressure is very close to one bar. So when we say one atmospheric pressure, we actually mean that the pressure is, pressure is around 100,000 Pascal or 100 kilopascal. So 100 kilopascal or one bar or 100,000 Pascal is about one atmospheric pressure. Another intensive property is temperature. Temperature is a figure to denote the uh, feeling of hotness or coldness. Because hotness or coldness are relative things, it depends, it changes from one person to another, we have to uh, give a number to it. And this number given to the feeling of hotness or coldness is called temperature. If the temperature during a process is constant, we call it isothermal process. Actually, when you have iso, it means something is constant. For instance, isobaric is constant pressure. Isentalpic is constant enthalpy. Isentropic is constant entropy and so forth. You don't know anything regarding enthalpies and uh, entropies, but in any case, when you see iso, it means something is constant. So isothermal is 
temperature is constant. Thermometer is a device that we can use for temperature measurement. A simple thermometer can be a liquid in glass thermometer. In this type of thermometer, there is a liquid inside this tube. And this liquid expands because of the increase in temperature. And this expansion is linear. If we have some scale on this thermometer, you can read the temperature of the medium. Another one can be using uh, infrared or it can be thermocouples in which two different materials are used. And when two different materials that have a common point, common contact, uh, when they are heated, they produce, produce electricity, a voltage. And this voltage is related to the temperature of the heated point, the junction. Sometimes resistance thermometers can be used because many materials change their resistances uh, according to the temperature. And there are also use of uh, semiconductors and the temperature measurement devices using semiconductors are called thermistors. The thermometer uh, temperature measurement, measurement devices that uses uh, radiation principles such as infrared or uh, pyrometers, they are called infrared radiation thermometers or optical py pyrometers. Normally, in calculations, we always use the absolute temperature scale. So if you are given a Celsius temperature, you have to convert it to absolute temperature first, then you can continue with the calculation. So do not forget to convert the temperature before you start uh, to, to absolute temperature, before you start the calculation. The absolute temperature is Kelvin plus 273. It has some uh, digits after the uh, point, but in any case, you can just take 273. So Celsius is Kelvin, the absolute temperature minus 273. And also you may need to convert uh, the IP temperature unit Fahrenheit to Celsius. So the Fahrenheit is 1.8 times Celsius temperature plus 32. Try to remember them, but if you do not remember them, I can provide, it, provide them to you. But these are very basic things. So I suggest that you remember these conversions, the conversions of Celsius to Kelvin, or conversion of Fahrenheit to, uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius, or vice versa. Here we have an example. It's not numerical, but uh, it's necessary to go over it because it's related to some concepts. As you can see, in the example, a wind turbine is given. The first system involves the wind turbine only. A second system involves a battery that is charged by the electricity generated by this wind turbine. So in the first one, we have a control volume because mass crosses the boundary of it. So it's a control volume. Mass comes in, mass goes out. Also, electrical energy crosses the boundary. So it's a system, but it's an open system. It's a control volume due to the fact that mass crosses the boundary. On the other hand, this battery is another system, but it's not an open system. It's not a control volume. Why? 
because there is only energy crossing the boundary, electrical energy crosses the boundary. Maybe it's losing some heat. It may be warmer than the surroundings. Heat energy crosses the boundary, but there is no mass crossing the boundary of the system. So this one is a closed system, whereas this one is an open system. So this example is to distinguish between an open system and closed system. So there is the explanation here. You can read it to yourself. So how can we... Uh, so a control volume must be an open... Yeah, control volume and open system are the same things. Sometimes you can see it as control volume, sometimes open system. They denote the same thing. As I said, thermodynamics is the science of energy, so we will be dealing with conversions of energy all the time when we study thermodynamics. The most common types of energy that you have seen in also physics is kinetic and potential energies. For instance, suppose that uh, a stone is thrown and it has a trajectory like this. And as it moves through the trajectory, its potential energy increases to some point, then the potential energy decreases, and its kinetic energy may be increasing, decreasing when it goes up and decreasing when it goes down. And the Calculation of kinetic energy change between the point one and point two is one over two m v two squared minus v one squared. So this gives you the change of the uh, kinetic energy between point one and point two. Similarly, you can calculate the change of the potential energy between point one and point two. And ideally, if there is no friction, if there are no effects the change in kinetic energy must be equal to change in potential energy. But because of external effects, because of air friction and so forth, uh, they may not be equal to each other. So during the conversion of kinetic to potential, uh, kinetic energy to potential or potential to kinetic, energy must be conserved. If there is no friction effect, Otherwise, we have to consider the external effects, which will be dealt in, dealt with uh, the calculation of the friction work and so forth. But uh, for an ideal system uh, in which there is no friction, the change in the kinetic energy is equal to change in potential energy. For instance, A substance, let's say a system, could be a car, uh, is accelerating from 15 meters per second to 30 meters per second. So its kinetic energy change is 0 0.34 kilojoules or 340 joules. And meanwhile, it's elevation decreases by 10 meters. So because of this elevation decrease, its potential energy change is minus 0 0.10 kilojoules or 100 kilojoules. As you can see, they are not equal to each other. So there must be something uh, external to it. For instance, the mass may be doing work or there can be friction. Otherwise, the change must have been equal. But in this case, we know that there has to be something external. Otherwise, they will be equal. Another concept is work. As you know, 
work is the effect of a force as it moves along a straight line. So in the first or basic definition, we obtain the work as force times distance. And force and distance must be in the same line. On the other hand, if they're not in the same line, we calculate the force as the scalar product of the force vector and displacement vector. So work is a scalar quantity and we obtain it as force vector times displacement vector. And as you know, this is just the magnitude of force times R times cosine theta. Theta is the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector. So this R times cosine theta gives the projection of the force on the moving direction. So uh, it is exactly the same as work is equal to force times distance. And in this case, the distance must be along the force or force must be along the distance. By convention, if work is done by a system, we take the work to be positive. On the other hand, if work done on a system, we take the work to be negative. I will explain it later, but this is important. This is just a convention. So we will use this convention, convention throughout the study of thermodynamics. If the work is done by the system, so if a system does work on the surroundings, is taken as positive. If the surroundings does work on the system, it's taken to be negative. For instance, consider a piston cylinder system. So if the gas inside the cylinder pushes this piston, then it's supposed to work. Otherwise, if let's say atmospheric pressure compresses it, does work on the system, in this case, work is negative. We will come to this point later, but just remember that if the work is done on the surrounding, is taken positive. If the surrounding does work on the system, is taken negative. Another concept is power. Power is the work or energy per unit time. So because by definition, force times distance is work per unit time is power. And if you take a look at this, it's just force times velocity that gives you the power. So energy per unit time, for instance, work per unit time is called power. If you have power applied by a system or done on a system for so many seconds or so many hours, you can calculate the total energy total work energy done on the system or done by the system by integrating it, integrating it over the time. So let's say you have power and time and power changes like this. So the total energy between this and that time is calculated from the area under this curve, which is 
W times dt. W dot times dt. By the way, when you see dot some uh, on something, a dot always means it's per unit time. So wherever you see some dot on something, it's per unit time. So W dot is W per unit time, and W can be energy, can be work. So it's work per unit time. So if you integrate the power and uh, the energy, total energy between zero and T can be calculated from W dot dt, the integral is obtained from the, uh, gives you the area under the curve and uh, it gives you the energy during this time. An example of power, so in order to calculate the power to be applied to the cyclist, we need to know the drag force as well as his velocity because the power must be calculated from force times velocity. What is the force here? Is the aerodynamic drag force and the calculation of aerodynamic drag force is given to you as one over two times cd cd is the drag coefficient ap is the uh, projection area of the cyclist v squared is the uh, velocity square of the cyclist so if you know the values as the drag coefficient 0 0.88 these, these are given the projection area of the cyclist, the area that's perpendicular to the motion, this area, 0 0.365 square meter. Uh, air density, uh, rho is the density here, I forgot it. Rho is the air density, is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. And velocity is 32 kilometers per hour, which is 8.89 meters per second because 32 kilometers per hour is converted to sorry 32 32 kilometers is 32,000 meters divided by one hour is 3,600. So in a practical way, you can take out three zeros here and divide it by 3.6 to convert kilometers per hour to meters per second. So it's 8.89 meters per second. The power is calculated to be 1.35 at 135.4 watts. And because 746 watts in one horsepower, the power of the cyclist is 0 0.181 horsepowers. We will uh, define the horsepower later, but one horsepower is the power necessary to move 75 kilograms of a mass to one meter height in one second. So if you have 75 kilograms of mass, meaning that its weight, weight is also a force. So 75 times 981 is uh, is the weight force and velocity is one meter per uh, one second so it's one meter per second when you calculate this you're going to get 746 and it's defined as one horsepower so 746 watts is one horsepower. 
sometimes we may need to calculate the power of uh, systems that has rotational motion instead of linear motion. In this case, we have a linear motion so that we have to use F times V, force times velocity. But in rotating systems, we should use something else. In rotating systems, uh, the power is obtained from torque times angular velocity. So in rotating systems, W dot, which is power, is torque. Torque is moment, the rotating moment, times the angular velocity. So torque is in newtons times meters, and this is in radians per second. So when you do the calculation, you get Newton meters per second, and Newton meters per second is what? So for the calculation of rotational systems, you need to know the torque of the rotating system, for instance, torque applied by this uh, motor, the motor shaft. You need to know the uh, angular speed. By the way, angular speed is two times pi times n dot. n dot is the revolution per second of the rotor of the shaft. So if you have the revolution per second here, times two pi is going to give you radians per second. So if you have uh, the angular velocity and the torque, you can calculate the power of this motor. And in order to obtain this power, of course, you need to provide an equivalent power. This equivalent power is actually the electrical power that you need to provide to it. And it's just I times V. It has a minus sign here because the work is done on the system. So that's why it has a minus sign. You can put a minus sign here, it doesn't make any difference. This minus means that uh, the work is done on the system. That's why uh, the, it has a minus sign. Otherwise, you can use it as IV. So this IV should be equal to torque times omega. Of course, there will be some losses like friction losses, heat losses, and so forth. But without the consideration of these losses, the output of the output power of the shaft must be equal to the input power of the rotor. But because of the concept of efficiency, it's not exactly like this. We are going to use the efficiency concept to determine how much of the input is converted to output. So the relationship between the input and output is efficiency. Efficiency is shown with eta. So efficiency is always some output divided by some input. So the output power tau times omega is always less than input power, which is times omega is always less than input power, which is I times V. So you should get something less than one here. And they are given in percentages. For instance, for the case of an electric motor, you can get something like 85%, 90%, depending on the motor type. But in any case, there will be always some kind of efficiency that gives you the conversion performance of the system. There are other kinds of work, of course. It's not only the force that does work. Sometimes we may need to calculate the force of work done by gas. For instance, uh, let's consider the work done by this expanding gas. The gas inside this inside the cylinder is expanding. So as it expands, it's going to do work 
of the surroundings. So this is a positive work because the system, the gas is doing work on the surroundings. So as it does work on the surroundings, the work is calculated by force times distance. And because, just take a look at this, pressure times area is the force. So this is the force applied by the gas on the cylinder, on the piston, and the distance is dx. We are talking about a differential work, so differential distance. And area times dx, which is the area of the, uh, of the cylinder in this distance, then you can show that you can see that the work done by the uh, by the gas in a closed system is just p times dv. If you integrate it from zero volume to maximum volume, whatever the maximum volume is, you get the overall uh, overall work obtained by the expansion of this gas. Of course. P is not a constant, so when you integrate this, you need to know the relationship between the P and V. So if you know the relationship between P and V, you can calculate uh, the work done on the on the surroundings during this expansion. An exam example of this, pressure is varying with the volume like this. So at the beginning, it had P1 pressure and D1 volume. As it has expanded to here, at the end, it has P2 pressure and D1 volume. You have to know this relationship of P as a function of vol volume. So you have to know pressure as a function of volume so that you can perform this integration. If you know this uh, functional relationship between the pressure and volume, you can uh, perform this integral and calculate the work here during the expansion of the gas. And this work is done by the gas on the surroundings so that it's a positive work. So during the expansion, work is positive. If the surrounding compresses the gas, if it does work on the gas, then it's a negative work. So this is just by conversion. So as you can see, uh, the work done during the, uh, during the compression or uh, expansion is very much related on the relationship between the pressure and the volume. Suppose that we have two processes, two different processes. One process is A, the second process is B. And as you can see, the function of P versus V is different from, in A is different from in B. So depending on the functions, we are going to get some different work because of the areas under the curves are different because as you know the curve uh, the area under a curve gives you in this case uh, the work done by the gas so work is pdv so whichever the uh, process you choose the area will be different. So depending on the process you choose, there is going to be some uh, different calculation of this integral. And this integral is the work and which is actually mathematically the area under the curve. If you are given a relationship between the pressure and the uh, volume as PV to the end to be constant, this is just one of the relationships. There are many relationships like this. Uh, but if it's, a, it's called the polytropic process, so this is called the polytropic process. In a polytropic process, the relationship between P and V is 
PV to the N is constant. So what it means is now that they're constant, we can write it as P1, V1 to the N1, N to be equal to P2, V2 to the N, and so forth. So uh, this is what it means. PV to the N is constant. So P1, V1, N is equal to P2, V2, N, which is equal to P3, V3 to N. So by using this functional relationship, we can calculate this integral and obtain the work necessary or work done. An example of this, we are given a polytropic process. When a process is poly polytropic, we know that the relationship between the pressure and volume is PV to the N is constant. If PV to the N is constant, you can uh, replace, for instance, P in terms of volume. So you can write the P in terms of volume. Of course, you need to know the value of N. In A part, N is 1.5. In B part, N is 1. And in C part, N is 0. What does it mean to have N is 0? When N is 0, you get this to be 1. So it's constant pressure. If the N is 0, it's constant pressure. Otherwise, depending on the value of N, you get uh, some other relationship between V and N. And because of the uh, different relationships, the area under the PV curve is different, meaning that the work is different. For instance, this is when uh, N is zero. When N is zero, we get uh, P to be constant because V to the zero is one, so P is constant. So this is when the N is zero. This is when N is one, and this is when N is 1.5. So depending on the situation, this is the maximum work you get if the pressure is constant. Then you get some less work if N is 1, and the least work if N is 1.5. Depending on the exponent and exponent, you get some different works. So, uh, the, uh, in the first case, the general case, because PV, PDV interval gives you uh, the work, and because PV to the N is constant, you can write uh, P as a function of constant. So, P is constant divided by V to the N. So this is what's done here. And the integral of constant divided by P to the, uh, V to the N is constant goes out. V to the N minus 1, because the integral of V to the N is V to the N minus 1 minus N divided by 1 minus N. Remember this. Dx over x to the n integral of this is x to the m minus 1 divided by m minus 1. This is from mathematics. So you have the same thing here. Because PV to the n uh, is constant, we can write it as P1 V1 to the n to to be equal to P2, V2 to the N. So we can replace them in this equation. When we replace them in this equation, we get something uh, very simple. So when, after the substitution, uh, we get the work to be P2, V2 minus P1, V1 divided by 1.1. If N is zero, this is not defined. So except for N is zero, you can use this as a general condition. So you can use this for M1, but N1.5, 
but not for n to zero because when it's uh, when n is zero, this doesn't have any definition. So except for the n is zero, you can use this. For the first case, with n is 1.5, 1, 1, uh, 1. you can calculate this. First, you need to know the value of the P2. You can get the value of P2 from this equation. So once you get the value of P2, you can calculate the work when n is 1.5. So the work done by the gas on the surrounding is 17.6 kilojoules. If in the second part, n is 1 instead of 1.5, you're going to see that the work necessary to uh, for this expansion is, uh, or the work done by this gas on the surroundings is greater because the area is greater. Look at the second area. The second area under the curve is greater than the, uh, the first area. That's why you have a higher uh, work than in the first case. For the last part, uh, when the n is zero, it's very simple because when is n is zero, we understand that pressure is constant. So now that we know one pressure, if n is uh, pressure is constant, we can write it as W P because it's constant, we can take it out of integral. So we get P V2 minus V1. If pressure is constant. So the last part is very easy. When the pressure is constant, everything is very simple. You just calculate the work as P times delta V, the change in the volume. And it's going to be the uh, highest work because if you look at the uh, graph, the curve, the area under this curve is the highest. So when N is 1.5, the work done by the gas is 17.6 kilojoules. When N is zero, uh, 1, you get a work of 20.79. And when pressure is constant, N is 0, you get the highest work. Other types of work, such as work by a spring. So if you compress spring, you do work on it. So this work is ne uh, negative. If a spring expands and it does, if it does work on the surrounding, this work is going to be positive. If you are stirring a fluid inside this, uh, inside this container, you are doing work on it, so this work is going to be negative. If you are charging this battery, you are providing work on it, so this work is negative. As you can see, depending on the direction of the uh, energy flow, workflow, energy is a uh, type of work, depending on the direction of the workflow, it can be positive or negative. So we talked about uh, energies such as kinetic potential and other types of energies. So we had to know that a system can have a total energy, which can be comprised of the sum of the types of the energies, such as potential, kinetic, internal, which I will mention now. So the sum of all these kinds of energy will comprise of the total energy of a system. So what happens when you add energy into a system? You change the total energy of it 
or when you, uh, you increase the total energy of it or vice versa. And what happens uh, internally other than kinetic and potential energy, other than kinetic and potential energy change is the internal energy change. For instance, the charging of this battery will change the internal energy of it or stirring of this fluid by rotating this uh, paddle, paddle wheel will change the internal energy of it. So we have to include not only the change in potential and kinetic energies, but also internal energies. Internal energy is shown with U and it's mostly related to uh, temperature, if it's a sensible internal energy, or uh, in general, it's called just internal energy. Internal energy deals with the energy related to uh, individual molecules and atoms and other subatomic particles. So the uh, energies of the individual parts uh, are the reason for the internal energy. For instance, if the air around you is warm, it's because of the air molecules that move faster than normal. So the sensation of the temperature is because of the uh, level of the internal energy. We have two types of energy interaction of a, a closed system with the surroundings. One of them is work, which we have just seen. The other type of energy interaction with the surrounding of a closed system is energy transfer by heat. So for a closed system, energy can be transferred by either work or by heat. In an open system, it can be also transferred by uh, stream of the uh, hot fluid or cold fluid. And in open systems, energy can be transferred by the mass flow of the cold or hot streams. So here uh, we can have another break, I guess. Do we have any questions? Uh, there are some questions, I guess. Uh, no. Do we have any questions? So we will restart at 3, 3 p.m. Let me just recording. Okay, recording has started. Uh, we don't know if the exams will be online or not, but I think they're going to be face to face because uh, there's a possibility that they will move the exam week one or two weeks ahead so they are planning to make the exams uh face to face not online uh this blackboard converts the file that i, I have uploaded here but during the conversion, something strange may happen. For instance, this W dot must be here. This Q dot must be here. It happens during the conversion of the files. But uh, in my shares in the older, they're all OK. So don't worry. Uh, for closed systems, as I said, energy can be transferred either by work, which we have just seen, or by heat. So when it's uh, transferred by heat, uh, it can be always from high temperature to low temperature. So, consider a system which is transferred energy by heat and work. If heat is added into a system, you always take it as positive. So, let me put it this way. This is the closed system. 
if the system does work on the surroundings, it's supposed to work. On the other hand, if the surrounding does work on the system, it's a negative work. But it's opposite for the case of heat. So if heat is added to the system, it's positive heat. It's Q. Okay. Otherwise, if heat is lost by the system, it's taken as negative. So that's why the net of the energy added as heat or work is written as Q minus W. The reason why we have minus here, because if the work is done by the done on the system, it's a negative work. But because we have also negative here, it's actually uh, positive. So it's actually Q plus W. But because of the sign convention, convention used for the work, we have a minus sign here. This is the reason why we have minus sign here. But effect of the work done on the system is going to be positive because it has minus sign, another minus here. So if work is done on the system, the effect is positive, actually. The net effect of the heat and work transferred to the system or transferred by the system, which is the energy transferred to the system, the total energy to the system or from the system, is going to uh, cause a change in the system energy. What is the system energy? It's the total system energy. And remember, the total system energy is the system energy change because of the kinetic energy, the system energy change because of the potential energy, and system energy change due to the internal energy. And internal energy change mostly appears as a temperature change or phase change, but for the time being, let's assume it as, uh, let's take it as internal energy change also. So this whole thing here is the change of total energy, and the total energy change is caused by the energy transferred to the system, either by heat or by work. You can also write this in differential form. In differential form is differential energy change, this whole thing, which is equal to differential uh, transfer of Q and differential transfer of work. Or time rate per unit time, you can just uh, divide everything by uh, time or take the time integral. The time integral of this is this one and time change of Q is Q dot. Remember that when you have a dot on something, it's always per unit time and work per unit time, which is work. So this is called uh, energy rate per unit time. And this is called work per unit time or power. So as you can see, uh, the system layout may be very different. In this, in the first one, the motor is rotated by a mass moving down. As the mass moves down, it rotates the motor. And when the generator, sorry, it uh, rotates the generator, this generator produces electrical energy, and this electrical energy can be uh, transferred into this liquid. So in this case, it's done by uh, heat, because as you can see, uh, there is a heater here, electrical heater, which heats the liquid. So it's a transfer of heat. It's not a transfer of work. It's a transfer of heat. On the other hand, if you take the uh, system boundary, not the, as the liquid, but also to include the heater also. So when the heater is also included in the system, then you can see that uh, it's the electrical work that uh, 
crosses the boundary of the system. So in this case, it's the transfer of heat. This is very important. If you take the system to be only the fluid only, which is heated by an electrical heater, then the transfer of energy is Q, heat. On the other hand, if you include the system to have the heater inside also, then it's the transfer of electrical work. At the end, the energy is the same, but in the first one, we call the energy transfer to be heat, but in the second, we call the energy to be work, which is electrical work. And if you include everything inside the system, including the uh, weight that's moving down, so as you can see, everything happens within the system and there is no interaction with the system and the surroundings. In this case, both Q is zero and W is zero because everything occurs within the system. There is no interaction of the system with the surrounding. Another numerical example, we are given a polytropic process, which is defined as PV to the 1.5, to be constant. And we would like to find out uh, the work done as well as uh, the heat transferred during the process of this expansion, this, uh, this process of going from P1 pressure, V1 volume to P2 pressure, V2 volume. And it says also that during this expansion, the internal energy of the gas changes from, uh, changes by minus 4.6. It means that the internal energy of the gas uh, decreases by this amount. This decreases because of the expansion of the gas. It actually cools down. So we need to include this change in order to calculate the uh, heat transfer between the system and the surroundings, because remember that the conservation of energy requires that the net change of system energy is equal to the heat interaction between the surrounding and system and work interaction between the surrounding and the system. Work is going to be calculated from PDV. This is the work. And once we find the work here, uh, DE is, uh, if you consider that the kinetic and potential energies are constant, then DE is just the change in the internal energy because kinetic and potential energies can be considered to be conserved. So you can calculate the heat interaction between the system and the surrounding during this process. Always start with the uh, first law of thermodynamics. This is called first law of thermodynamics or conservation of energy equation for closed systems. The change in the kinetic energy is zero, potential energy change is zero. The internal energy change is given, and uh, the change in the internal energy is because of the net energy transfer to and from the system. And this net energy to and from the system is the heat energy to and from the system minus work energy to and from the system. And the reason why we have minus here because the work done by the system is positive, so it's a loss. And work done on the system is negative, which makes this positive, which is a gain. The DU, by the way, uh, when you have something in small case, it's called per unit mass. So small case U, internal energy is capital case U divided by the mass. So this is 
let's say in kilojoules per kilogram. So this is called specific internal energy, internal energy per unit time. So M times internal, uh, specific internal energy is going to give you the normal internal energy. So M times U2 minus U1, which is uh, equal to Q minus W. And we're interested in finding the heat interaction during this process. <clears throat> this is given to you in the uh, statement of the process. It says uh, the change in the kinetic energy is minus 4.5 six kilojoules per kilogram and of course you need to know the mass of the gas to find this so you see that the q interaction the heat interaction during this process is minus 0 0.8 kilojoules it means during the expansion the piston does work on the surroundings but meanwhile there is a loss of heat because it's minus of 0 0.8 kilojoules it means that the cylinder is not well insulated. That's why it's losing some heat to the surrounding. We understand this from the minus sign. If it was perfectly insulated, for instance, this could be zero. And in some cases, it's also possible. But for this specific problem, we understand that the system is losing this much energy during this process. In this example, uh, we are given a piston cylinder system in which there is air. So in this piston cylinder system, there is air. And this air is heated by an electrical heater. So a system boundary is taken to exclude the electrical heater Everything in this problem is given in SI units, uh, IP unit systems, but I have converted everything to uh, SI unit systems. The pressure is 101,000, which is atmospheric pressure. So in the beginning, the pressure is uh, one atmospheric pressure. Because of the heat provided to the system, air, as you can guess, it's going to heat it up. When it's heated up, it will expand. And because the piston is free here, it's open to atmospheric pressure. So at the top of the piston, we have atmospheric pressure. So we have the atmosphere here. And because it's a free piston, as the air is heated and it's expanded it will expand freely so it will come something like this to this point but because there is always the same atmospheric pressure we can say that the pressure inside does not change we have constant pressure because it's a free moving piston so this pressure is uh, given to you as 101 kilopascals or 101,000 uh, pascals, which is one atmospheric pressure. The mass inside the piston is 45.3 kilograms, constant because it's a closed system. Remember that in closed systems, the mass does not change because there is no mass crossing the boundaries of a closed system. The change in the volume due to this expansion is given to you, it's this much. Uh, the mass of the uh, air is given to you and internal change of the air during this process is also given to you and you need to have the gravitational ex uh, exploration. You need to understand that the pressure inside the air is partly because of the piston weight because it applies a pressure on the gas. And uh, this plus the gas pressure must be equal to atmospheric pressure, 
because they're in equilibrium. So we always start with the same conservation of energy equation. The total energy of the system, kinetic potential internal energy, is going to be changed by the energy transfer to and from the system. The energy transfer to and from the system is energy transfer by heat minus energy transfer by work. And you know the reason why we have minus here already. So uh, we would like to calculate the work, uh, the heat transfer during this process. So we can assume that uh, the change in the uh, kinetic energy is zero. There may be a little, very little change in potential energy because uh, the piston moves up, but we can assume it to be zero because it's very small. Then Q is W plus uh, delta U, the internal energy change during the process. And it's given to you, the internal energy change, change during the process is given to you. So if you put everything together, we can calculate the uh, Q. Because pressure is constant, why is it constant? Because it's open to atmosphere. So the piston will move up freely, meaning that the pressure inside the pist uh, cylinder will always be atmospheric pressure. So when the pressure is constant, we can take it out of the integral. Then the work done during the constant pressure is just P times volume change. Volume change is already given to you so that you can calculate the, uh, calculate the work done by the gas. And uh, P times A piston, which is the piston force, is the piston weight plus the gas uh, gas force. So we have uh, two parts of the uh, force on this piston. It's partly because of the uh, piston weight and the gas pressure. So uh, at the end of the motion, we can calculate the uh, Final pressure, so the pressure is uh, the piston force plus atmospheric pressure. It's 105 kilopascals. And from here, if you put it in here, you can find uh, the Q. It's not shown here, but in any case, you can calculate the Q from here by using this work plus the change in the internal energy. So you have Q to be equal to uh, work by the gas, the potential energy of the piston and internal energy of the air Work by the pist uh, gas has already been found as this. Uh, the potential energy of the piston is also calculated, but uh, as I said, it's very small when compared to it, but you can include it as well. And the change of the internal energy of the gas during this process is M times uh, delta U. In the original slides, you will see that they are delta not D, they became delta and D because of the conversions. In any case, you will see that uh, the Q is uh, the sum of the work plus uh, potential and internal energies of the uh, piston and the gas. So we started with this general equation here and uh, we obtained Q to be equal to W plus the change in the internal energy of the gas 
W is the work done by the gas on the piston plus work due to the change in the potential energy. Even though the potential energy uh, change by the piston is small, we can also include it here. You can see that the amount of the work done by the potential energy change of the piston is small. So uh, this is the uh, Q interaction of the process with the surroundings. So it means that this is the amount of heat added to the to the system here to obtain this much work as well as the change in the volume, which appears to be the potential energy change by the piston. Another example is a gearbox. In this gearbox, uh, there is an input shaft and output shaft. Input shaft has a power input of 60. And uh, note that it has a minus sign because the work is done on the system. That's why it has a minus sign. And output shaft also has a work uh, value, but it's going to be a positive one because in this case, the system does work on the surrounding. So here work is done on the system. Here work is done by the system on the surroundings. And meanwhile, because uh, this gearbox has lubrication oil in it, and because of the friction, this lubrication oil is heated. And because of the heat transfer uh, between the oil and the case, the case is warmer than the surrounding is 300 kelvins because the surrounding is 293 kelvins there will be a heat transfer from the warmer uh, case to the surrounding the amount of uh, heat transfer from the case to the surrounding is calculated from this formula so q dot which is the heat lost by the case to the surroundings is H times area of the case times delta T temperature difference between the case and surrounding. This is called convection formula. Don't worry about it for the time being. Just assume it as it is. But the way we calculate the heat loss from the case to the surrounding is by using this formula. H is called convection coefficient. It has to be given to you, which it is. A is the area of the uh, H is the area of the case, and delta T is the temperature difference between the case and surrounding. So. As you know, uh, the conservation of energy equation can be written in rate form also. When we write it in rate form, uh, the time change of rate and uh, time change of uh, energy, DDT, is going to be equal to Q dot minus W dot. So everything is in per unit time. But in the statement of problem, it says it's steady state. So when a system is under steady state. If something is under steady state, we know that uh, the change in time is zero. So when something is in steady state, the time change is zero. So this is what we call steady state. So it means that phi is constant if the system is 
in steady state. So in this case, if the system is under steady state, then the heat, uh, heat loss per unit time or the energy change per unit time of the system is constant because it's steady state. So if something is constant, then its time derivative is zero. When time derivative is zero, everything becomes easier because you get W dot D equal to Q dot. Q dot is calculated from this convection equation. It's minus 1.2 kilowatts, meaning that it's a loss. It's 1.2 kilojoules per second, in other words. So uh, work, of course, here we have input work and output work. Input work is minus, output work is plus. So one of them is input work. The other one is output work. We have two types of work here, input work and output work. Input output. And input is going to be taken as negative and output is going to be taken as positive. So output work is found to be what well, minus 1.1, 1.2 minus input is minus 60. So it's interesting to see that the output work is less than input work. Why? Because some of the lead energy is lost as a heat energy because of the uh, heat loss. As you can see, we have less output work than input work, meaning that the efficiency of the system is not 100%, but it's less than 100%. You could find the efficiency as output divided by input so you can calculate the efficiency as 88.8, which is output divided by 60. So you can say that uh, the efficiency of this gearbox is, I don't know, 95%, 96%, whatever. So the reason why we have uh, efficiency less than one is because of the losses. In this case, it's a loss of heat. Sometimes it may be some other loss, but yeah, 98%. Okay, thank you. So we can say that the mechanical efficiency of this gearbox is 98%. Another example is cooling a microchip. So Suppose that we have a microchip in our computer or in our telephone or whatever it is, and it has to be cooled by using convection. So some fluid, for instance, air must be blown onto it to cool it. The principle of the uh, convection requires that the heat removed per unit time cooling heating, whatever, is H times A times H times A times delta T, as in the previous problem. So if you are given H, if you know the area of this chip, this chip area, if you know the temperature difference between the uh, chip surface temperature and the surrounding, the surrounding temperature is given as fluid temperature. The air blow onto it is as 20. So uh, it says that uh, uh, if heat transfer between the chip and the substrate is negligible, so there is no heat transfer between the chip and the bottom, substrate is the bottom. And if the heat loss due to this cooling is 0. 225 watts, it has a minus sign, meaning that uh, this is the work, sorry, electrical work put into the system. So this is the electrical work. This is the power supply to the system, uh, to the chip. 
is minus 0 0.225. If the heat transfer between the chip and the substrate is negligible, determine the surface temperature of the chip in Celsius. So we are going to write uh, the conservation of energy equation in rate form. So we will do it like this. The total energy change per unit time is equal to Q dot minus W dot. And as in the previous case, if it's steady state, which it is, then this goes away because it's steady state. And W dot is given, which is the power supplied to the chip. And we would like to find out the value of the Q dot, which is actually the heat loss to the surrounding. And once we find the Q dot, it's equal to H times A times delta T. And from here, we can find the surface temperature of the chip. So we start with the rate form of the uh, conservation of energy equation. This is zero because of the uh, steady state. Then we can write the Q dot. It's minus because it's a heat loss. And uh, we have the W dot as the power input to the chip. So we can calculate the surface temperature of the chip from this equation. So it looks like the surface temperature is 80 Celsius. This is very important because in electrical, electronic elements, we would like to have the surface temperatures not to get so high. We need to specify the surface temperature, the maximum surface temperature, so that we can know how much cooling is necessary. If the chip has to have a, a maximum temperature of 80 Celsius, then we need to provide this much cooling, this much cooling so that the surface temperature will not exceed the specified temperature, which is 80. It could be something else, but this is a very typical value in most of the uh, computer chips. The surface temperatures should be kept below 80 Celsius. And uh, this is actually one information regarding the necessary cooling system. Because in order to get this convection coefficient, you need to have a specific amount of airflow because the convection coefficient is related to air velocity. Air velocity is related to volumetric flow of, flow of air, and volumetric flow of air is related to the capacity of the fan that you're using in your computer. So uh, let's now take a look at the cycles. Remember that a cycle is a sequence of uh, processes that starts at some point and ends up at some other point. So remember that power plant, in the power plant, water started as liquid, then in the boiler, boiler it became uh, vapor, then as it passed through the uh, turbine, it's still vapor or sometimes vapor plus liquid at a lower, a lower pressure, then it has to be converted to liquid in order to pump it back into the boiler again. So as you can see, the finishing and starting points of a cycle is the same. That's why we call these systems or sequence of systems, uh, we call these systems to be cycles. In a cycle, because ending point and the uh, starting point the end point, and the ending point is constant. We have a, a interesting thing in a cycle. Because starting and end is the same. So 
or in a cycle because the start point and, and the ending point is the same, we have a situation where the net energy change is zero because starting and ending is the same. Where the net energy change is zero, if you look at the conservation of energy equation, we get Q dot and W dot to be equal to each other. So in the case of a system, which is a cycle, we have a situation where Q dot and W dot or Q and W are the same. So this is an important result for a cycle. In a cycle, the total energy change is zero, so that uh, Q dot and W dot or Q and W must be equal to each other. It means that the net heat energy to and from the system from the cycle must be equal to network energy to and from the cycle. We're going to uh, learn about the cycles later, but let's, let, let's take a look at this cycle first. In a cycle, we use uh, two power, uh, two temperature reservoirs, a hot, high temperature reservoir like this, and a cold temperature reservoir. As the heat flows through the uh, flows from the high temperature reservoir, which is also called a source, to a low temperature reservoir, which is called a sink, work is obtained. So consider that to be the boiler in the power plant, and this one to be the condenser, where the uh, vapor is converted into liquid. In between, we obtain work which is the work obtained in the turbine. So as you can see, it's necessary to reject some of the heat. Otherwise, the cycle cannot be completed. So as a rule, it's not possible to convert all the heat to the work. This is a very strict rule. It's called a Carnot principle. According to this principle, it's not possible to convert all the work to heat, uh, all the heat to work. And some of the heat must be rejected, otherwise the cycle cannot be completed. This is a power cycle. The second one is a refrigeration cycle. Refrigeration cycle is actually the reverse of a power cycle. So in the case of a power cycle, uh, we obtain work by using two uh, reservoirs, one hot reservoir and one cold reservoir. And as the heat uh, flows through the, from the hot reservoir to cold reservoir, <coughs> heat is, uh, some of the heat is converted into work. In the case of refrigerator, because for the engine case, uh, energy flows from high temperature to low temperature by itself. So this is by the uh, second law of thermodynamics. Energy must flow from high temperature to low temperature. In order to have the energy moving from low temperature to high temperature, which is the case inside the refrigerator, then we have to provide external energy. So Without the provision of external energy, it's not possible to move energy from cold reservoir to high, high reservoir, high temperature reservoir. So consider this to be the uh, to be inside the refrigerator in your kitchen, and consider this to be the kitchen itself. So in order to remove energy, absorb energy from inside the refrigerator and to reject it to the surrounding, it's necessary to provide some external energy, 
which is the energy provided by the compressor motor of the refrigerator. So for the heat engine, you have a very similar system, two reservoirs, hot reservoir, cold reservoir, as the heat flows by itself from hot reservoir to cold reservoir, you get work. But in the case of uh, refrigerator, you still have two reservoirs, but in this, in the case of refrigerator, you have a, a reverse flow of energy from cold to hot, but this is only done by addition some external energy. So with the addition of, without the ex, uh, addition of external energy, it's not possible to remove energy from cold reservoir and to reject it to the hot reservoir. We also mentioned uh, the term efficiency. Efficiency is always some output always, some output divided by some input. So for the case of heat engine, the output is of course work. So work and the input is Q in the heat added into the system. So this is called the efficiency of a heat engine. And it's always less than one because first of all, some heat must be rejected. This is the main reason why we have an efficiency less than one. And there are other reasons which we'll explain later. How about uh, the refrigerator? In a refrigerator, we don't have a definition as uh, as efficiency because efficiency is used in engines. It gives you a figure to determine how much of the input energy is converted to work. So that's why we use the term efficiency in the case of a engine. But in the case of a refrigerator, we use something else because here we do not get any work instead we get cooling and this cooling this cooling is obtained by the addition of the uh, work so we should use some other uh, definition instead of uh, efficiency as in the case of the uh, heat engines for refrigerators we use coefficient of performance and coefficient of performance is the amount of cooling, so Q in, which is uh, the output, versus the energy added into the system, the compressor work. And it can be most of the time greater than one because it's not efficiency. We do not have to worry about whether it's less than one or greater than one. Most of the time, COP, the coefficient of performance, is greater than one. Sometimes it may be given as beta. So for a refrigeration cycles, cycle, we use the term COP instead of uh, efficiency, which is used in the uh, in the heat engines. These are a little bit uh, confusing concepts because uh, they are very new to you. In the chapter of cycles, we will understand the uh, definitions and the reasons why uh, the efficiency must be less than one or a coefficient of performance can be must can be greater than one most of the time. We will come to these late uh, details later, but for the time being, just keeping uh, keeping your mind that efficiency must always be less than one, and COP can be greater than one, which is most of the time greater than one. Otherwise, sometimes it can be less than one as well. Some Refrigerator systems, such as absorption systems, can have COPs less than one. But as I said, don't worry about them. 
for the time being. So uh, this is the end of the chapter. We cannot start the next chapter. Uh, do, do you have any questions so far? Okay. So let me first stop.